morning. morning. And welcome to Resurrection Lutheran Church. I see some new faces, some visitors and guests, uh, some of those who are familiar that we haven't seen for a while. Welcome, welcome all of you. We are so happy to be worshiping with you this morning. Join us after worship in the fellowship hall for a cup of coffee. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us on Facebook Live and later in the week on YouTube. Good to worship with you as well. A few announcements before we begin worship. Following worship this morning, there will be a meeting in the conference room uh, for any of you who are interested in teaching Sunday school. We're just going to talk through the curriculum. We're going to pray over the program and kind of do some uh, some planning. So um, some teams are forming. Lest you think that you might have to teach on your own, some teams are forming, so you may be able to pair up with one or two or three other people uh, to do the Sunday school hour, and this is just a huge blessing. So join us for that meeting. Uh, after worship. Please return this Wednesday for Ash Wednesday worship on Valentine's Day. Uh, we will have the imposition of ashes and begin the season of Lent uh, with the call to return to the Lord our God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in love. Uh, please join us for that. And then join us next Wednesday, the 21st, as we start our midweek Lenten series with a soup supper uh, before each of those five services. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet out in the narthex if you want to bring soup or bread or dessert for those meals that start on the 21st. Finally, just a couple of health announcements for uh, people who belong to our faith family. Becky Miller had a successful hip replacement surgery this week. She is home and recovering and recuperating, and we thank God for that, and we thank God for uh, the care that Tony is giving to her. Um, I'll also announce that Eric Latinsky has been admitted to the Mankato Hospital. Uh, he has pneumonia and diabetic ketoacidosis. He had uh, terribly high blood sugars as a result of the infection, and they're trying to get those balanced out. Uh, so please pray for Eric and Sharon as Eric has been admitted to the hospital as well. Those are my announcements. Uh, I will leave the rest in the bulletin, including the calendar of things happening this week for your careful care and consideration, including the E-Omi, which will be on Tuesday uh, morning at 11. And with that, we will begin our worship service, and I'll ask you to please rise as you are able for our invocation and our gathering prayer. We gather under the sign of the cross, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. God of majesty, through Jesus' transfiguration, you reveal him as your beloved Son. Keep us faithful in the promise that through the cross and the empty tomb, we are joint heirs with Christ and will one day enjoy the fullness of your glory for eternity. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And would you remain standing as we sing our opening hymn, How Good Lord to Be Here? It's printed on the back of your bulletin.
and forgiveness of sin. The psalmist writes, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the path everlasting. We cannot come before God unless we are first honest with ourselves about the mistakes we make. In this spirit, let us offer our prayers to God, and let us make mention internally and silently on the sins that bring us such guilt this week before we name them over. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, and what our hearts can no longer bear. Set us free from a past that we cannot change, and grant us grace to grow more and more into your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. God so loved the world, that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. It is true that we have sinned, but it is a greater truth that we are forgiven through God's love in Jesus Christ. To those who humbly seek the mercy of God, he says, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Amen. The cross is the best. 
best Valentine's Day gift that we can ever receive. Because on the cross, Jesus died to save us from our sins and to one day bring us to heaven. That's a big gift, huh? And you know what? Here's the best thing about the big cross. Is we don't have to wait until Valentine's Day every year to give it. We get it every day. Every time we come to worship and we say, God, we're sorry for our sins, he gives us this great big Valentine's Day hug. And he says, I love you more than you'll ever, ever know. So remember that on Valentine's Day this week, when you're getting and giving all these gifts to your friends, God loves you more. Should we pray about that? You want to hold your hands and bow your head? In congregation, will you pray with Roman and I? We'll say, dear God, thank you. For your, love. for your love, in Jesus. In Jesus. Thank, you Thank you for giving it, for giving it to, us. to us. Help us, Help us to, give to give others your love. Your love. In, Jesus name. in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, here you go, Ron. You're the only one who came today. Do you like the big Valentine's Day card? Oh, yeah. Do you want to take it with you? You don't know? How about we leave it up here, and if you want it later, you can come back and get it. Okay? But I do have something for you. Come on over. How about a Valentine's Day card? You want one of those? Yeah. All right, you go ahead and take that to your seat. Thanks, thanks for coming. Helen's going to come and open our eyes.
after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And Jesus was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For Peter did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace for yours this day, dear friends, from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. There are no two more terrifying words in the English language when they are put together than wait and see. When we are standing at the bedside of someone we love in a hospital room and the doctors have come to the end of their abilities, they've pushed all their medications and they've exhausted all the treatment options and they turn to you and say, I guess we're just going to have to wait and see how their body responds. It's frightening. When the high school senior hits send on the college application to their top school of choice, and the guidance counselor sitting next to them says, I guess we'll just have to wait and see if you make the cut. It's unnerving. Let's wait and see how the stock market reacts to the latest catastrophe in the world. Let's wait and see what kind of effects this mild Minnesota winter will have on the fields this spring. Let's wait and see how the presidential election pans out in November. It's all very alarming, because it's all very much out of our control. This morning in our Gospel text, we meet the inner circle of Jesus, Peter, James, and John, as they are standing, watching a dazzling event unfold with very little control over it. We've come to Transfiguration Sunday, the bridge that connects the season of Epiphany with the season of Lent. We stand today on the precipice of Ash Wednesday, but before we can get there, we have to remember where we've come from. The season of Epiphany began with some magi from the east making their way to the place a toddler Jesus was living in Bethlehem with his parents. They had followed a bright, shining, piercing star for hundreds of miles until it came to rest over Mary and Joseph's home. And if there's one thing that the wise men teach us, or at least confirm when you roll them in with the rest of the Christmas story, it's that this child is no ordinary child. This child, as heralded by the angels, is a savior. This child, as heralded by Anna and Simeon, is salvation on two feet, the revelation to the Gentiles, the fulfillment of God's eternal plan. And this child, as heralded by the stargazers from Babylon, is the shepherd of Israel. So throughout the last several weeks, we've watched the Christ child epiphany among us revealing himself among us, walking and working among us, all while hiding his divinity just under the surface of his skin. Well, lest Peter, James, and John think that this is just going to be a normal, ordinary day on the ministry trail, they'll have to think again. Before their very eyes, Jesus is transfigured. And this word transfigured is very odd. In fact, I can't remember the last time I used it in daily conversation. But we get the sense that what these men are seeing is something that they've never experienced before. Suddenly, Jesus gives them a glimpse of the living God in his flesh. The same glory that was in the pillar of cloud and fire 
as God led his people out of Egypt and through the Red Sea. The same glory that Helen read of this morning from Exodus, the glory that radiated off Moses' face when he came down Mount Sinai, the same glory that dwelled in the wilderness tabernacle and then later in the Jerusalem temple, this glory epiphanies reveals itself, transfigures Jesus Christ. And there's more, so, so much more. As if this blinding light illuminating Jesus and his clothing isn't enough, through the light beams, Peter, James, and John can see Moses and Elijah standing and talking with him. Moses, the great lawgiver, and Elijah, the great Old Testament prophet, flanked alongside Jesus Christ as if to say, this is the one that we spoke concerning of. This is the one who is revealing and fulfilling the promise God made all the way back in the Garden of Eden. You know, friends, I think we've read this story so many times over the years and have become so familiar with it that we forget how shocking it must have been. In fact, Mark Plato tells us that Peter, James, and John were terrified by what they were seeing. The people of Israel were afraid to come near Moses when he came down off Mount Sinai with the tablets of the law. And for so many of us, terror only leads to incessant babbling and chatter. Having been affirmed that Jesus is indeed the presence of God, the God of the universe, and gawking at Moses and Elijah standing there before him, what Peter should have said was, wow, how good it is that you are here with us. But what comes out of Peter's mouth is, wow, how good it is that we're here to see you. And how good it is, Peter says, that I'm here to lay out this fantastic plan. I'm going to build each of you a tent to dwell in. You're never going to have to leave this mountain. You can rule and reign from here. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you've heard me say it a million times. I love nothing more than the raw humanness of Peter. I love that because he can't come up with anything else to say, he has to yet again put his foot directly in his mouth and formulate a plan that at its very core is attempting to control something that is out of his control. Peter would love nothing more than to bottle up this moment and hit the pause button forever. Because if he does succeed at constructing these three dwellings for these two Old Testament heroes and Jesus, perhaps, just maybe, he can have a little authority over what comes next. Someone at lectionary lunch this past week brought up that perhaps Peter wants to build these tents because he's afraid Jesus will go back to heaven with Moses and Elijah. This way, Jesus can be kept around for longer than he planned. Perhaps this way, by staying on the mountain, all the people of Israel needing healing can have one place to go to. Their own private urgent care. How about that? Instead of having to wait for Jesus to wander through their village. We don't know, ultimately, what's going through Peter's mind, but we do know something. This feeling of not having control has brought Peter to the edge. And how many of us here this morning can't say we've never felt the same ourselves? We've sat through those wait and see moments and we're not a fan. We've watched Parkinson's eat away at a spouse's body without being able to do anything to slow it down. We've watched, or are watching, our children's marriages fall apart without being able to intervene. Every 
night, we hear more and more about the strife that is escalating in the Middle East, and we are completely unequipped to change the course. We stand on the sidelines and observe the, con the colossal and monumental mistakes a friend or co-worker is making, and we even, in our own flesh, do the things that we know we shouldn't do, but do anyway because we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. Our world is unruly and violent and disordered and reckless, and this is terrifying. But terror is not the last word. As is always the case, God gets the last word. In a cloud, God overcomes, overwhelms, envelops, engulfs the disciples who can do nothing but babble and shake, and God says, listen to my son. And by the time Peter, James, and John look up again, Moses and Elijah are gone. Because you see, Jesus is not an equal, or a colleague, or a contemporary with these two men. Elijah and Moses are going to have to go the way of John the Baptist, decreasing while Jesus increases. The reign of the law and the oracles of the prophets meet their end in the flesh of Jesus Christ, because in Jesus Christ, heaven and earth collide. The era of the law and the prophets is over. And now only the words and life of Jesus Christ can bring comfort and hope. Now only the words and life of our Lord Jesus can bring salvation. So this morning, here at Resurrection Lutheran Church, I can only imagine the uncontrolled chaos that each of you is facing in your own lives or hearts. I know not the health battles you face or the family drama that is sucking you dry. I know not the burdens you are carrying and the mental and physical load that is pressing down upon you, but I can guess, like Peter, James, and John, that you are terrified, at least in part, by something that is spiraling out of your reach. But instead of helping you get back under your dominion what you are losing control of, I'll proclaim this. What you are losing control of is firmly in the grasp of our Lord. What you no longer have dominion over is firmly under the domain of God. What you can no longer hold in your fingertips is firmly in the power of the creator of heaven and earth and all that exists. And this one who grasps all things, controls all things, dominates all things, is speaking to you. When you open up the pages of scripture and you let his word wash over you, when a member of the priesthood of all believers declares that for Jesus' sake your sins are forgiven, when you are handed the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus and hear the words, this is for you, these are the words of eternal life. Only Jesus, only his
God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ, living together in this peace and in community with one another, let us confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Congregation may be seated now as we continue to worship God. At this time we offer our prayers for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all, whatever their needs may be. Let us pray. Our good and gracious Father, beautiful Savior, King of creation, Son of God, and Son of Man, we give you thanks this day in the midst of all the changes in this sinful world that we cannot control, that we can rest in your eternal changelessness. You are God yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Shine the light of your presence in our midst and on our path, and open our ears to hear your word, that in faith we can place everything we are and have and do into your hands. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Sovereign One, we pray for our education system at every level and in every place, from preschool classrooms to halls of higher ed. We remember before you educators, administrators, paraprofessionals, custodians, food service workers, secretaries, bus drivers, Shine the beams of your wisdom onto every classroom, every office, every lunchroom, every playground. That fear and knowledge of the Lord might be imparted, safety and peace would be kept, and true learning would be done. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord of the nations, as Moses the lawgiver and Elijah the prophet bore witness to your Son, so true grant that leaders of every nation and people, especially those here in the United States, would bear witness to your greatness. We pray for our elected and appointed leaders in the United States, that together with our citizens they would lead peaceable lives of service for the neighbor, that they would use their authority for the benefit of others and not their own self-interest. We pray for President Biden, Vice President Harris, Speaker of the House Johnson, President of the Senate Murray. We pray for Governor Walz, the Minnesota Legislature, Mayor Massad. Lead with courage and strength every elected and appointed leader at every level of government. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Protecting one clothed in the armor of your life, all those who risk their lives to protect the innocent and defend liberty and justice, that they might serve with purpose, honor, and competency. We pray for our protectors, for our military men and women, our first responders, firefighters, law enforcement officials, EMTs, medical community, aid workers, and the like. Grant them safety, forbearance, and integrity to use their labors to accomplish your will. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, you are the strength of the weary and the hope of the weak. You heal the brokenhearted and bind up their wounds. You are a strong power and refuge. Have mercy on those who are in any need, those who are lonely, distressed, forgotten, grieving, frightened, those who are in prison. We pray for those recovering or preparing for or from surgery, for those whom death is drawing near, the hospitalized and the sick, especially Paul, Jackson, Donna, Joe, Craig, Luke, Kendra, Elise, Stephen, Donald, Becky, Eric, Joanne, and with them, those we remember in the silence of our hearts before you now. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, as you walk out those doors this morning, you are walking into a world that you cannot control. A world that is very much out of control. But you rest firmly in the grasp and fingertips of the one who created you from the dust of the earth and has promised to redeem you and save you. Go forth in the way that he goes with you and go forth with this benediction and blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our sending hymn is Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. It's number 40 in the Reclaim Hymnal. Would you please rise? Love you.